Uh, so I'm Sara La Fuerza. I'm currently a scientist at uh, ID26 Beamline uh, for X-ray spectroscopy at the ESRF synchrotron in Grenoble. And today I have the pleasure to talk to you about one of our recent projects, which is about the chemical sensitivity of core-to-core -core X ray emission spectroscopy in 3D transition metals. So for this investigation, uh, what we did is a systematic K-beta and K-alpha X-ray emission study on a wide range of iron compounds, as I will introduce you later. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the people involved in this work. So first of all, Andrea Carlantuono, who was our master thesis student and with whom we started the project already two, three years ago. Uh, then Marius Rettegan, who supports us with uh, multiple theory calculations. And then my supervisor, Peter Glatzel, who is a beam responsible of, of ID26. So I will start with a very brief introduction to K emission in general, focusing on K emission after photoionization and in 3D transition metals. So here I distinguish between two different regimes, the non-resonant, when the excitation energy is well above the Fermi level, say about 100 dB, and a resonant regime where the incident energy is really close or much closer to the, to the Fermi level, say some few EV. So K emission is a photon in photon out process, and as such, it involves two steps. So in a first step, we have the excitation of one core electron into either the continuum in the non-resonant case or into some available state near the Fermi level for the resonant case. And after this, this uh, excited state can decay through different dipole allowed transitions. So for K emission, we have uh, K alpha emission lines and K beta, where we distinguish actually between core to core and valence to core transitions. So uh, here on the right, I just plot a very broad K emission spectrum measured on, a, on an iron reference compound, iron 203 oxide. And you can see that the most intense lines are the K alpha lines, which come from a 2P to 1S decay. The next, uh, we have the K-beta core-to-core lines, which are about eight times weaker than the K-alpha lines and are the result of a 3P to 1S decay. And then uh, at higher energy, we have the weakest lines, which are the valence to core lines, about 500 times weaker. And in this case, uh, the transition is directly from the valence band to the 1S level. So here we can already see a difference between the core-to-core K-alpha and K-beta transitions and the valence to core. So while in the latter, the transitions are directly from the valence shell, and therefore they are directly sensitive to it, in K-alpha and in K-beta, uh, the sensitivity to the valence band is indirect. And we have to think of other electron-electron uh, interactions that actually at the end will give us some chemical sensitivity as well to the, to the 3D valence band. But due to the overlap of the 2P and 3P wave functions and the 3D valence shell, you will see that the chemical sensitivity is considerable and it is quite useful. So having said that, I, I switch now to some uh, description in terms of atomic multiplet theory. Electron-electron interactions are actually the, the dominant mechanism that shapes the core to core emission lines, both K alpha and K beta. But there is an important difference between the two. So in K alpha, the dominant interaction is the 2P spin orbit coupling, uh, which is greater than the 2P 3D interactions. Uh, here uh, in this table, I just put as an example, I don't want you to focus too much on the, on the numbers, but it's for a 3D5 ion, a simple case of a 3D5 ion. And we have here the values of the Slater integrals here and the, the spin orbit parameters for the K alpha transition and for the K beta transition. So in the K alpha, the 2P spin orbit dominates over the, the Slater integrals. Therefore, we are in the JJ coupling scheme and the, the spin is not a good quantum number. On the other hand, in the K-beta case, the 3P3D interactions here, uh, you can see this uh, exchange Slater integrals are dominant. And they are much larger than the 3P spin orbit coupling. And therefore we are in the conditions for Ellis coupling scheme. That means that the different electronic states are, we are well described by these 2s plus 1 l atomic terms, where s and l are the, the spin and the orbital angular momentum. 
So that means that it is much simpler to, <laughs> to then uh, explain or introduce a relationship between the k-beta emission spectrum and the spin. And then this is why I, I focus now on this case. So I again pick the simplest case of a 3D5 ion. So we start from a ground state uh, with five electrons in the 3D shell. And after photoionization, we send one electron into the continuum. I will always focus in the non-resonant case. And we can have two different intermediate states, a 7S, or a 5S with a core hole, either with a spin down or a spin up. And I want to, to focus on these two different intermediate states because they give rise to the two uh, main contributions in the k-beta spectrum. So now we will look a little bit more into the finest structure of the apparently simple line shape because, okay, we basically see two peaks, but okay, it is actually much more complex than that. But okay, to, to, start, to start with something, let's, let's describe it this way. So the 5P state with a 3P a uh, core hole with a spin up character gives rise to the k beta prima feature. And the 7p state has then the core hole with a spin down, and then this gives rise to the k beta 1 3 feature. So the energy difference between these two states is given by the, by the chain's interaction. And as a result, we have a splitting between the lines, which uh, is the chain splitting. But uh, extracting such a splitting, which relates indeed to the 3D spin, is not that easy because indeed there are not only two multiplets, but the k-beta spectrum is, uh, is made of a rich multiplet structure. For instance, uh, mixing between states may give rise to, to other electronic states, like for instance, this 5p star, where there was a spin flip in the 3D shell and we have a different 3D configuration. And its contribution, for example, is at the low energy side of the, of the main peak. So this is just to show that things may be much more complex than basically just two final states and two multiples. There are many more and even more for a 3D6 configuration, for example. So now in order just to make the link to the, to the other core to core lines that we want to study, which are the K-alpha lines, um, the K-beta main splitting is given by the chance interaction, which relates to the spin, as we will see later. And in the K alpha, in the K alpha, I just remind you that the main splitting is given by the two pins by the two p spin orbit coupling. Okay, so the K alpha one comes from two uh, p one half to one s transitions. K alpha two two uh, p three halves one s transitions. But still, uh, the change interaction between the two p hole and the and the three d electrons gives rise to uh, to changes in the symmetry and width of the lines. So there is still some sensitivity in these lines as well. And the best is actually to look at one example. So here I just show you uh, the data on two model iron compounds, uh, high spin iron sulfide and low spin iron disulfide. So you see here then the lower splitting and the almost absence of k-beta prima feature in the low spin sample. And the high sensitivity to the, to the spin state change in the k-beta and even if there is a bit uh, less of degree of sensitivity, uh, K-alpha lines are sensitive as well. So we see in particular for the, for the low spin sample, uh, much narrower widths in the K-alpha 1 and K-alpha 2 peaks. So a priori, both lines are probes of the spin state, but we keep in mind that to a different degree. Uh, for instance, here this different signal between the high spin and the low spin sample is about 65%, and here we are on the order of 40% or so, I think. So having said that, just a quick overview of some remarkable examples. So both K-beta and K-alpha access has been used for spin state determination studies uh, from material science to biochemistry. And it is true that because the relationship with the spin uh, is more direct in K-beta, traditionally mainly K-beta has been used to follow a spin state transitions. So, for example, uh, it has been applied in the study of high pressure or temperature dependent studies of minerals or oxides. Um, as well, uh, access is very used in time resolved uh, studies, for instance, of highly radiation sensitive uh, proteins, because uh, it doesn't need a monochromatic X ray and it can be combined then with diffraction and it can also be very useful to track uh, some sample degradation. And as well for pump and probe studies and to study some transient states and spin state evolution there in, in photoswitchable molecular systems. So this is just a, a quick slide, sorry, just to introduce some remarkable cases. Okay, and I think there is a growing 
uh, community of, of sex uh, happening right now everywhere. So having said that, uh, I'd like to introduce the motivation of, of our work, why, why we wanted to carry out a systematic study. So we were wondering whether we could obtain more insights into the chemical sensitivity beyond this ionic picture in terms of a spin state. And already in the late 60s, uh, Tsutsumi developed this expression for the exchange splitting, which is then valid for both k alpha and k beta. Okay, this is just for the exchange splitting. And it is equals to j 2s plus 1, where s is the net 3D shell spin, and j is the exchange integral between the core hole and the 3D electrons. So, of course, because of the larger overlap between the 3P and 3D wave factions, uh, J is much larger for, for K beta than K alpha, and, and therefore this already gives a hint to the different sensitivity. So, one of the questions we wanted to, to address in a systematic way was whether there was really the same sensitivity to the speed or the same chemical sensitivity in both core to core lines. Also, um, this J uh, integral here uh, can give us also some hints about some effects of covalency. So indeed, uh, covalency effects were reported previously. For instance, in well, it, they were reported mainly for K-beta. And for instance, here uh, in this set of nickel two plus compounds, we can see significant changes, a little bit like similar to the ones we have seen before between high spin and low spin uh, iron uh, disulfide, uh, sulfide and disulfide uh, for all these nickel two plus uh, samples. Um, as well, uh, this is a very nice study by, by Chris Pollock on iron 3 plus compounds where they also found and investigated the, the covalency effects in, in K-beta spectra. So in order to, to address all these points, then we decided to do a systematic study on as many iron compounds as we could find. I think maybe um, I could do maybe some, some break for questions, just maybe in this introductory part, if it's okay. Yes, uh, everyone should remember to uh, put your questions into uh, yeah. the chat. Uh, I'll start with a question or two. Um, so um, you're going to describe measurements on a large set of materials for iron. Have there been previous studies of this type for any of the transition metals where someone has gone and measured 20 or 30 compounds to look for systematics? Um, I don't think uh, studies with as many compounds as, as, as 30. But there are, there are many studies. Um, I think there is a very interesting study by, by Kramer, but it is a bit more general on different 3D transition metal compounds and only K-beta. But I think they, they do from titanium, chromium, uh, surely manganese, iron cobalt. So that's a very interesting one. And uh, then I was going to say that, of course, uh, for SAS, of course, I mean, there are very nice studies uh, on, on many iron minerals. But other than that, Mm, no. Okay. I, I, uh, I would say. Hmm. Okay. A second question is you've really been um, uh, focusing on the XES, uh, but in parallel, there's a long history of Zane's measurements to try to address these questions. Is the coordination between the Zane's and the XES something you're going to talk about later? Yes, at the very end of my talk. Okay. Um, I, I, think, I think at the end, um, both types of spectroscopies are complementary and they, they need each other, I think, because um, I think most of, okay, of course, I mean, there is some, some indirect uh, probe of spin state changes because, okay, typically the bond distances change. So, so one can see, one can study that with x or even in the exchange with a shift or whatever, but also the pH is really, is really sensitive to, to what happens at the 3D band. But I think bo both of them are important, but but I mean, this sensitivity to the exchange interaction really makes a very direct connection, I think, to the spin. So it's a little bit, yeah, how can I say, more straightforward maybe to extract spin state information. Um, yeah, there is much less influence on one distance changes and other things that may be happening at the same time. Some structural change that maybe it's coming, it's coming from something different than a spin uh, state transition or whatever. But definitely the two of them. It's interesting that XES having less sensitivity is often a benefit uh, <laughs> uh, uh, for diagnosing things. There's a few questions. Uh, can you go back to the slide that shows the FES to XES? Yeah. Oh, this one. This one, exactly. The question is, does the FES to low spin have a K beta prime peak? 
<laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. So already from the simple model by Batsutsumi uh, with the formula that I, that I just introduced to the chain splitting, because it is nominally spin zero, in principle there should be no splitting, so one should imagine no peak at all. But clearly there's something else, I would say that there's something else because there are other effects that, that, that shape the lines. I mean, at, at the end, okay, the dominant is a 3P through the exchange interaction, but there are other multiplets that, that, that may come. So I, I would say there's something there, but uh, there is some intensity. Clearly it's not really a complete absence of, of a peak. Okay, very good. And last question before you continue is uh, whether you're going to tell us things about both solid and solvated samples. Ah, yes, yes. Maybe you should have stopped at the, <laughs> after introducing the, 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 the okay, samples. You don't have to so, tell us about it now. <laughs> yeah, maybe I will, then I will yeah, continue a little bit. I will introduce the samples that we measure and then right. start with the first results and I will do then a, a, a break before, yeah, some final analysis. Okay, so then may I continue here? Okay, thank you, Jerry. Okay, so I'd like to start then providing you with some experimental details about our systematic investigation. So we collected more than 30 iron bearing compounds, which had various oxidation and also spin states. So we had iron 2+, plus, iron 3+, plus, 4+, plus, and even mixed valence samples, and also samples with low and high spin states and also mixed states. And the important thing is also that we had samples covering different types of ligands, so with different ionic and covalent degrees. So of course, I will not mention all of them one by one. We had different families, uh, sulfides, cyanides, of course, oxides, uh, fluorides. And yes, we had some iron ions in solution, iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus ions, which were actually the, the only uh, yeah, solvated samples that we measured. Or, yeah, I would say that most of them, yeah, they are solid state samples. So we had commercial samples, but also samples uh, that were provided by some collaborators. And I take the opportunity to acknowledge uh, Javier Blasco, Dominica Bastel, and Frederick Hardy for providing some of the, of the compounds. After that, just, just quickly, of course, the experiment was done at ID26 Beamland, which is the Beamland where I work. And an important remark here is that all the compounds were measured in the same experimental run, which is very important in terms of, you know, comparing different energy calibrations or whatever. So now um, we just did two experimental sessions, uh, one spectrometer alignment for K alpha and another spectrometer alignment for K beta. And all the compounds were measured under the same conditions, let's say. And uh, okay, another point is that, of course, we, as, as Jerry was mentioning before, we collected as well X-ray absorption and spectra, but in this case, the main goal for that was to, to check for sample quality uh, and also to monitor radiation damage, okay, because at ID26, we can quickly scan the monochromator and yeah, that gave us, yeah, some, yeah, much easier check on the, on the radiation damage. Um, Next, uh, just a few details about the computational details. So the multiplet calculations uh, were carried out using Prispy, which is a software by Marius Redegan, and is a graphical user interface to the multiplet methods in the, in the Quanti library. So just uh, like a few features of the simulation. So we did two steps, so the oxidation of one electron into the continuum, and then the decay either 2p to 1s or 3p to 1s. Um, in order to model the covalency variations, what we did is basically to introduce a, a Kappa prefactor in front of the Slater integrals. Um, and we did not do actually more sophisticated attempts to, to, to model the lines or to model the changes that, that we see. But you will see that this already um, reproduces qualitatively the experimental evolution. And an important note as well on the, on the final state lifetime broadening, just a, just a warning. So it was indeed uh, demonstrated already in the late 90s by Taguchi that actually when simulating K beta spectra, if one uses a constant lifetime for the final state, um, one doesn't really reproduce the, the experimental uh, spectra. So it actually overestimates the intensity in the K beta prima feature. And this is because actually um, the final state is like term dependent. And a nice approach that he proposed is to use a linear dependent broadening. And this is what we did for both K beta and K alpha. So we didn't use a constant final state lifetime broadening, but an energy dependent broadening. And actually this is a limitation for these calculations to be, or to have more quantitative power, as I would say. Um, so basically we just tried to 
to give a qualitative yeah, interpretation of what we see, but we didn't want to go further because at the end, this parameterized nature, uh, nature of these calculations, of course, we can play with no matter what on the final state or, or whatever and do whatever. So that was not our intention. <laughs> But uh, it's an important point. I mean, uh, surely uh, with a constant lifetime, it could have not worked. Okay, so having said that, I'll start already presenting our experimental results. And because we had many, many compounds, I just focus here on the, on the item 2 plus high spin samples. And I want to start actually looking at the covalency variations. Indeed, uh, here uh, we have the set of, the, of these samples, and you see that the, the variations are really, really significant. Actually, if you think of the iron 2 plus ion in solution is the more ionic sample, and then we, we keep going towards more covalent character, uh, towards the oxide, sulfide, and even this nictite, you see that the k beta primer uh, feature smooths really a lot. Uh, it almost disappears, or it almost looks like the, the low spin iron disulfide sample that we have seen before. So the calculations by, by changing this kappa prefactor, so scaling the, the Slater integrals, are able to reproduce this decrease in the k beta prime and k beta 1, 3 splitting. On the other hand, let's see what happens for the k alpha spectra of the very same compounds. Unfortunately, we could not measure the liquid samples for the k alpha sessions, so they are not there. But you see that the covalency variations manifest as well in the k alpha lines. Uh, the effect is less pronounced in the sense that they affect mainly the width, so it's not like a change in the main splitting of the of the spectrum, but is you know changing the the width and the symmetry of the line. So the same when we go towards more covalent character, we have narrower peaks, and the calculations actually by scaling the Slater integrals predict uh, quite well or capture quite well this this effect. And now, having said that about the covalency variations, I'd like to do a quick introduction on some spectral indicators that we have extracted from the from this spectra to try to follow the spin evolution. So these three parameters are commonly used to, to, to study the spin state changes in the spectra and I will just mention briefly each of them uh, because these are the ones that we have extracted. So we have the k beta 1 3 first moment which is basically like the center of mass of, of the peak. Uh, k beta 1 3 is asymmetric so it's quite interesting to use this approach rather than just choosing the maximum of the peak. Uh, then another possibility or another uh, parameter typically used is the k alpha one for we have maximum. We have seen that the, the width correlates with the, with the spin. And a third method is a, is a very robust method and it was first proposed for access uh, by Banco and it is called the integrated absolute difference. So it evaluates the change in spin between two spectra by integrating the absolute value of the difference. So basically when one has a set of a spectra, like for example here as a function of temperature, uh, one chooses a reference spectrum which is then subtracted to all of, of the others and then it, one integrates the, the absolute value of this difference. And it is a very useful method for very small changes actually to, de to detect very very small changes. So we extracted these three parameters from all our battery of spectra and compounds and I'd like to show you how they evolve as a function of the nominal spin. So I start with the k beta 1, 3 first moment. So here I plot the values versus the nominal spin. And the data points are grouped into the families of compounds. And we can see that on average, this parameter increases uh, with the nominal spin. But also a very important result as well is that, for instance, if we look at fixed uh, nominal spin values uh, because of the covalency variations that we have seen in the very beginning, we see a spread of the, of the values. And the same, for example, now if we look at these two uh, low spin samples that we measured. Then um, what we did is to try to see how the different spectral indicators or parameters correlate to each other. So I still uh, keep with the k beta parameters. And to evaluate how well or how bad they, they correlate, we just plot one uh, versus the other and extract the Pearson correlation coefficient. So for instance, if we stay with k beta and we plot here the k beta ID values, where we used indeed the iron disulfide as, as a reference uh, versus the k beta 1, 3 first moment, we can see that they are highly correlated, which we take as that uh, in, in the case of k beta, the two parameters are really 
sensitive to the exchange splitting and therefore they are reliable uh, probes of the spin state. So now that we have seen that, uh, we were wondering to what extent then the parameters that we have extracted from K-alpha uh, do the same or don't do the same. So now I'll plot actually the correlation of the K-alpha parameters versus this uh, K-beta-1-3 first moment. And we can see that we have much less correlation for the full width of the K-alpha spectra and even much uh, poorer correlation with the K-alpha IED value. Um, this means that in K-alpha spectra, we have additional contributions that compete with the, of course, with the um, 2P3D exchange splitting. And therefore, um, it is a warning because uh, about the extraction of the spin states from this, from this spectra, because there are other contributions that may uh, be as significant as, uh, as the exchange interaction. So, um, Another parameter that we also extracted from the spectra is the center of gravity of, of the full um, energy range. Uh, here we try to see a correlation between a possible shift of the center of mass of the, of the full K-beta or K-alpha spectrum and, for instance, ligand electronegativity. Because um, one can think that the screening effects will be different depending on the covalent character of the sample. So in the more covalent case, in principle, the, the, the screening of the 1S core hole will be, will be less because the, the, the electrons are more distributed in, into the ligands. Um, however, uh, here I plot the different values that we got for the K-beta and K-alpha center of gravity versus the average ligand electronegativity in the samples, and we do not see any systematic correlation of higher values um, of, uh, of center of gravity uh, as a function of the electronegativity. And similarly, we try to observe whether it correlates also with the oxidation state. For example, picking the fluoride samples where we had iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus for the oxides and, and so on. And we didn't see any systematic dependence. So that means that despite the changes in the spin state that we have seen among the samples, uh, the changes due to different oxidation state are not really detectable, the changes in the, in the center of mass. So, you know, if we compare, for example, with the shifts that one sees in the exchange, which are on the order of few EVs, uh, here, I mean, I think, yeah, we are really, the, the shifts that we see, they are really about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 EV, and they do not seem to have any correlation with oxidation state. Um, of course, I think then for sulfur K alpha lines, there is also a clear correlation between the, between the shift and the oxidation state, but this is not what we observe for the, for the case of iron um, K beta and K alpha access. And having said that, I think maybe I will suggest to do a break here because, yeah, because the next part is all analysis of different signals and I think it's a little bit a different, <laughs> a different thing. So if someone has any question, I will, I will be pleased to, to discuss. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, Evan, you had a question? Hi. Yeah. Uh, so first, thank you. This has been a really great talk so far. I've enjoyed it. Um, I have one question, which is in the first section, you'd mentioned the existence of a shoulder feature, uh, slightly lower in energy or between the K-beta-1-3 and the K-beta prime ah. due to flips in the 3D band. Um, I guess my question is, you know, obviously, as you look at different chemistries, uh, sort of the asymmetry of the k 13 changes, as you change kappa, it seemed to also influence the shoulder. Um, obviously, there are lots of things that can cause asymmetry in XES, but are there any sort mm -hmm. of rules of thumb for how large the shoulder should be with, say, different chemistries? Mm -hmm. I, I never looked into that, <laughs> so I, I know there, there must be some intensity there coming from this uh, spin flip, um, but I, I never looked into, yeah, how the asymmetry, yeah, that, that's a good point, and that could be interesting probably to try to do some fitting, maybe, to try to, to be a little bit more sensitive to what happens in, in that uh, in that part of the of the spectrum. So indeed, because we, we consider it is so difficult to disentangle the different contributions, um, yeah. sometimes maybe following the, the first moment gives a correlation to the chain splitting and and we didn't want to, to go <laughs> deeper into maybe into the into the you know the underlying multiplet structure because indeed the, the, I mean when you see the simulations for example that Marius did for us you see really many many sticks uh, so there are many multiplets and many transitions so it's 
it's, it would be difficult actually to really isolate one contribution, but one could try to see if there is some systematic dependence maybe by, by doing some fitting, I, I suppose, but we didn't really look into that very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you also. Sorry, Maria, you had a question? Um, yeah, on slide 12, um, you show the simulation with the multiplet code. Um, it, it, it does not seem to me that the peak actually disappeared. It just seems to move out. Um, yes. In, um, whereas, you know, in, in the data, um, your necktie, for example, it, it really is gone. Um, so, so what is happening there? Yes, I, I totally agree with this observation. So indeed, yeah, um, the intention of the multiple calculations was basically to, to, to provide some qualitative description of what is going on. So I, I think at least uh, an effect in terms of covalency changes, which we model by, by scaling the slater integrals, is already able to provide a decrease in the chain splitting. So we take it as this, but you are completely right that Experimentally, one really sees this, this shoulder completely smooth, and this is not at all what happens in the simulation because, indeed, uh, the peak goes up <laughs> in intensity. So, right. I mean, could, could it be that um, the use of the atomic overalls in the multiple is, uh, is actually problematic? Yes, yes, de definitely. Because even if um, I think CES, uh, XES is a very, very local probe, definitely. I think the yeah the, the choice of the wave functions of the orbitals at the I mean at the end there is also some impact of that of the of the real physics or of real solid state samples uh, on the on the line shape so yeah yeah Thanks. okay okay uh, Gilles you have a question uh, yes good morning my name is Gilles Dominico I was uh, relating to the the covalency effect with the ligand electronegativity. How do mm -hmm. you define that? And the one thing I was a little surprised is to see the water and the cyanide mm -hmm. was ah, indicated okay. at the same. Yes, okay. This one. Okay. So the ligand electronegativities were just estimated uh, based on the um, Pauling electronegativity value. So just doing the average according to the, to the ligands. So, okay, we just took this, I mean, we're just trying to see if there was correlation with, with parameters and this was a parameter that then we could easily uh, derive for, for, for the different samples. And uh, we, tried to do, we tried to do that. But the question was why the, the water was next to the cyanides. Indeed, um, because the, the um, ligand electronegativity here was calculated for the hydrogen and oxygen atoms, uh, even though <laughs> I was also not very happy to put these data points here because I know that the um, iron ions in solution, they are really, I mean, they are typically highly ionic samples. So yeah, they, they should have a higher value of electronegativity, but this is the way we estimated this value. Maybe we didn't do it right. <laughs> well, it might be interesting to do in the future to do a, a, a broader solution study where you can look for systematics uh, among the solution samples. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Matt Neuville, you had a question? Uh, yeah, uh, so, so thanks for this. I, actually, uh, this is very helpful because we're actually measuring some iron Ricks and Herfty yesterday and today, so this is very helpful oh. so, so you kind of understand <laughs> what we're measuring. My question okay. uh, is, is more um, like a technical. On page 16, you show that the integrated area difference and the, mm -hmm. and the first moment yeah. are highly correlated. It, is that just saying that like mathematically those two measurements, those two samplings of the specter are actually just the same? They're both integrals and, and so not you shouldn't expect that they're very different and that they should give you the same chemical information or is there something more that I missed? Mm, no, I think that that's, a, that's a, I mean, the, the message that, that we get from this comparison, but then of course, um, what one has to say that in our case, we were just doing a systematic study. We were very lucky we had as much sample as we wanted. So we basically just right. put in the very concentrated samples 
so I have to say that the data quality was was, was quite, quite nice. <laughs> so we had no problem right, right. at all with that. And, and then, you know, I think both parameters, uh, I mean, the systematic error in both parameters, it's really, really small. But then when it comes to maybe real measurements and samples where the concentration of the element of interest is, is really small, uh, then, yeah, then one finds then problems, for example. Yeah, then the ID, uh, I think, would be a little bit more robust to detect small changes. For example, if you have small changes and maybe noisy data, I think I would pick that method rather yeah, I, than, the, than the first moment. Okay, great. Thanks. That's very helpful. That's exactly okay. what I wanted to know. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Yeah. thank you for the question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, last question is um, uh, whether you had any particular issues with radiation damage and how you mitigated them? Okay, yes, actually, I think out of all the samples that we measured, we, we saw some damage on the cyanides and on the iron 3 plus in solution. <laughs> so how we mitigated them, uh, basically, we just uh, estimated some, some threshold times, some threshold exposure times where we considered the sample was intact and we would just stay below the, that limits. And if needed, we just put in some aluminum filters to attenuate a little bit the beam if it was necessary. Okay, very good. You should continue, please. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so, oh, sorry, I was too fast. Okay, so now I will basically just to finish with the last part of the analysis, which we did in terms of the, of the different signals. Um, when I presented some of the remarkable examples, I think you could see uh, there are some, some differences because very often access is used to follow an evolution of the sample versus some external parameter, either pressure, either time. And plotting the different signal, um, it is actually um, very often done. So we wanted to look a little bit more in, into this by just selecting different compounds. And the first set of different signals I, I want to show you are different signals coming from a nominal spin state variation. So I start with one different signal that probably is already familiar to you from the beginning, the one that we get from a high spin to a low spin change in the I don't sulfides. And I just want to point that in this case, we are not changing oxidation state. So this is then the difference that we get for the K beta data. And on the right, I show what we, what we get from our calculations without, you know, um, hammering the parameters or without actually trying to, to, to reproduce fully the, the spectral line shape. So of course, uh, yeah, we still see some shoulder in the, in the K-beta prima of the low spin iron 2 plus uh, uh, simulation. But overall, we can see uh, a good agreement between experiments and, and calculations for this case. And if now we switch to the K-alpha data, where we also tried the, the simulations, we can see that then here, um, these calculations are not able to fully reproduce experimental data. So at the K-alpha 1 level, things are quite reasonable, I would say. But at the K-alpha 2, we, we, we are not able to reproduce with this design, or we didn't want to, to how can I say, to, to, to cheat, <laughs> okay? Because maybe also trying to change the, the final state data, lifetime broadening and things like that. But that was not the purpose. So with, with that level of, of calculation, this is what we get. So maybe one, yeah, ideally one would improve a little bit uh, these calculations. And now um, I want to look at another different signal. In this case, we have also a nominal spin variation. In this case, it's smaller. It's not a total variation of 2, but a total variation of uh, 0.5. And in this case, it's between iron 3 plus and iron 2 plus oxide. So we are also changing the oxidation state, so the 3D count. So for the K-beta case, uh, these simple calculations, I would say, are able to reproduce quite well, at least we see the same type of sign here, you know, up and down and then down up feature. So the calculations are able to, to reproduce what we see in the experiment. But uh, for K-alpha, the situation is really, really bad. <laughs> um, and this, this comes because uh, as soon as you start playing with different electron counts in the, in the calculation, so 3D6 and 3D5, then yeah, there are many multiple, many contributions and one gets this kind of thing. And now I'd like to just to, to give some general conclusions on this type of different signals due to nominal spin variations. Here I group uh, the, the ones that we have for K-beta and here the ones that we have for K-alpha. So I think the message here is that for K-beta, we always get a systematic line shape. So I mean, 
for a decrease uh, in spin, we always get a downwards feature here and an upwards feature here around the K-beta-1-3 energy. So that means that uh, all these differences are really coming from, from changes in the chain splitting and changes in the spin. The driving force here in the set of K-alpha differences, which are actually differences for the, for the same compounds uh, plotted in, in, the, in the left for K-beta, we can see that the, the behavior is much more complex. Um, we have different signs, for instance, between the groups of uh, cyanides, sulfides, and for example, the oxides. And currently we are not able to explain why. Uh, obviously, this is likely due to the fact that uh, the chain splitting is not the dominant interaction here, and there may be other interactions which are really important and are also changing things around. So <laughs> this is also an, a, nice, a nice result. And um, next, I also want to look at some of the different signals. And these are the ones due to covalency variation. So in principle here, we just took some samples with the same nominal spin state. And for, it, for instance, a change in covalency from an ionic fluoride and a more covalent oxide gives uh, rise to this type of different signal. And again, uh, by just changing this kappa, so the scaling of the later integrals, uh, the calculations uh, reasonably, reasonably reproduce what we see in the experiment. In this case, we didn't have the, the data for the k alpha, so that's it. And another interesting result, and in the line of these covalency variations, is what we see when we compare two samples where the iron is in the same spin state and only the local coordination changes. So this is a change between an iron 3 plus high spin sample with octahedral symmetry uh, to uh, uh, the same, I mean, a uh, similar compound where the coordination is tetrahedral. So indeed the type of different signal that we, we see here in line shape agrees with the one that we have just seen before. So this agrees also with a covalency change and actually uh, demonstrates that indeed also XCS is sensitive to this uh, change in covalency due to a change in, in local symmetry. So of course the tetrahedral coordination is more covalent, so there are more impaired spins in the outer orbital compared to the octahedral case, and this is what we see. And to a smaller extent, K-alpha as well. In this case, we have also the K-alpha data. And I want to finish actually with a very, very last example, which I call the exception, because so far I have, say, I have uh, said that all the K-beta different signals had this kind of line shape. So here I take the case of the fluorides. So they were all up, down, down, up. So different signs that the K-beta prima and K-beta 1, 3 features um, indicating a change in the chain splitting. However, we found out for the iron ions in solutions a completely different thing in the sense that when we do the difference between the iron 3 plus sample and the iron 2 plus sample, where we expect a, a decrease in the spin, we see the same sign at both features and importantly at the, at the, the main feature in the different signal has a completely opposite, uh, an unexpected opposite sign, which is suggesting maybe a, a local spin lower in the iron 3 plus sample. So that was quite shocking to us and indeed of course since we had the XAS data, we looked into that. Um, the, the, the samples or the spectra seemed to agree with the expected iron 3 plus and iron 2 plus line shape. So here are the, the iron ions in water solution and here are the fluorides. But it is true that when doing a closer inspection into the, the pre-edge region, so this is now what we will do now here, um, we can see here that in the case of the iron 3 plus in water solution, the two peaks in the pre-edge, which are uh, indicative of the T2G and EG orbitals, uh, show a different ratio compared to the to the fluorides, for example. So here we see the expected intensity for a 3 to 2 uh, ratio between the T2G and the EG, but here we see a 2 intense peak for the EG orbital contribution. So the XAS data seem to indicate that we have a strong PD mixing in the EG orbitals, so we have a different PD mixing, but uh, which is orbital dependent, let's say, in the, in the 3D band. So currently we are not able to simulate this with the multiplet calculations. We cannot, I mean, because our scaling factor was, you know, was global. So we are not able to, to yeah, to, <laughs> to prove this with, with simulations, but we think this could be an explanation because it's not like a simple covalent change because otherwise just the change in covalency, it is explained also in terms of the change of splitting with the, with the J integrals, with the scaling. So we couldn't do, we couldn't explain it this way. And with that, I'd like to finish with the conclusions, with the conclusions of the slide. So 
I think in this study we have confirmed that covalent C strongly influences not only K-beta lines but also K-alpha. Uh, from the K-beta spectra we can say that the change splitting variations are quite well quantified by, by the two parameters that we have explored, the first moment and the ID, and they result the changes in a, in a systematic different signal line shape. So therefore we, we confirm that they are reliable spin uh, sensitivity uh, spectra and an important message maybe is to always look at the different signal line shape because for instance uh, the signal that we have just seen before from the water solutions if one does for example ID analysis or whatever I mean it can lead to wrong conclusions or one can assign some uh, spectral change to a change in spin but I think to really you know to really prove that it comes from a spin state change the, the difference uh, signal line shape it, it should really be the typical shape that we have found Regarding K-alpha, uh, because of the smaller exchange uh, splitting interaction here and the strong influence of other interactions, uh, it is difficult to extract a quantity that reliably relates to the spin. So just a warning on that. Uh, still, because of the more intense lines, uh, they are uh, an, attractive, an attractive alternative. For example, if one does, I don't know, um, in situ experiments or experiments where, for example, the legal environment doesn't change much, I think they, they can be still uh, reasonable. And of course the crystal field multiplet calculations uh, can be used to qualitatively describe the, the spectral changes, but of course uh, we have seen many anomalies in the, in the different signals and this calls for further efforts in, in theory. Um, I finished with that. I, I just want to thank you all for, for your attention. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, so as people start putting in their questions, uh, I'll start. Okay. <laughs> um, did you also measure the valence decor uh, region for many of these samples? And can you tell us anything about possible spin sensitivity in that region? Mm. Uh, unfortunately not. <laughs> I had this question in uh, another talk that I gave. So unfortunately not, that would have been great. But of course, I think there are papers, I think maybe one of the um, bibliography, one of the references that I suggested, the, the, the paper by, by Banco, I right. think there they also include, yeah, yeah, there is some spin sensitivity as well in the Venice to core. Then one has to think that, of course, um, one loses in camps a lot, but there is some spin sensitivity there as well. And it has some fundamental interest, of course, to, to understand why. Uh, at the end, you are there directly sensitive to the Venice band, so yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, next question is a bit tangential. There's a large literature on trying to get at oxidation state and other properties from the ratio of the integral of the K-alpha to the K-beta. And I was curious if you thought that that was something CRISPY could uh, reliably calculate. Okay, so you mean to try to get oxidation state from the ratio between K alpha 1, K alpha 2, or K beta no, prime no, and K beta 1? The, the, the whole ah, the ratio. Ah, the... Yeah, uh, this, is, this is done when people have uh, low energy resolution detectors like SD. All right. It's in the okay. XRF community. I mean, it's very controversial. Ah, wow. Okay, I have to say that I'm not aware of all this, so, so I am not sure, but th yeah, of course, that would be a question for, for Marius, who is the course. developer of CRISPY. Uh, I have to say that so far, actually, um, it is not fully implemented, this uh, XCS simulations, in the sense of the, the um, finite state lifetime broadening, uh, energy dependent is something we had to do a little bit by hand, so he was really in charge of, of doing the, all those simulations. So I am not sure it's a question for Marius. <laughs> we, we can pass him on the question somehow, but uh, okay. But thanks for the comment because I, I was not aware of that, but uh, definitely yeah, sure. it would be really useful if there is a real correlation between yeah, the ratio and okay. the oxidation state. Uh, Jens, do you have a mic available? Uh, yes, I do. Hello, great talk and thank you for this. A uh, short question is like, uh, that's a fantastic study and I, uh, it's really nice to see a systematic approach of actually uh, collecting spectra. Uh, I was wondering if you plan to continue this with more complex uh, ligand, uh, ligand structures where you have stronger pi donation, sigma donation and uh, different ligand interactions. And related mm -hmm. to this, uh, is there plans to maybe, uh, besides just publishing this, maybe also putting this in the central database, uh, this feedback uh, on how the sample was prepared? Okay, yes, of course. So, so currently we have no plans to, to really continue. 
uh, on this, but definitely, or yeah, I mean, at the end it's true that that was part of an in-house project in, in the sense that, yeah, sometimes maybe only people or BIMM staff can maybe dedicate the time to this because otherwise we are all involved in projects which are more kind of, you know, scientific rather than really systematic. So it's true that, that maybe everyone has a chance to dedicate, I don't know, some days or some BIM time to, to, to this, even if it's really nice and it's really useful. Um, so I, I don't know, it's not currently on my plans, but we will see, but definitely it would be really interesting to, to do it also for other 3D transition metals. And actually uh, we have just submitted this work and currently is under review. Um, I think hopefully in the following months, I think if, if, the, if the revision goes well, uh, should be published. So yeah, I, we will try to, to make some publicity <laughs> on the research case or the, the usual means. And uh, yeah, I hope that then everyone can. But of course, I'm always happy to share data. If I mean, then of course, there is the problem of different resolutions, different types of spectrometers. So it's not always easy to compare, but if ever, uh, yeah, I mean, feel free to ask for, for some data because, of course, we, we are happy to share. I mean, no, no problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Evan, do you have uh, one more question to ask? Hi. Um, so I have one more question to ask. Um, obviously, iron is sort of a tricky case in XES um, due to uh, sort of being notorious from charge transfers in the excited state uh, coming from the ligand, um, I think first reported in by Kauai. Um, in sort of the trends that were being established in part three, there were oftentimes sort of intra-oxidation state trends or um, where oftentimes this charge transfer would mix up those oxidation states. I guess what I'm wondering is in your analysis or if you were to apply this to a new system, do you guys do anything in order to try and safeguard against anomalies due to these charge transfer events? Okay, thank you for that question. I am not sure if I fully understood. So you, you mentioned between some intra charge transfer uh, an intercharge transfer. So you mean between the um, the metal ion and the ligands? And can you yeah. maybe refer? Yeah, because I am. Okay, so could you please repeat me the question? Um, sure. I guess um, the question's coming from. I mm -hmm. think it's a 1994 paper by Kawai uh, Jun Kawai. Ah yes, on the on the nickel. Yeah, on the nickel k beta. Uh, I think he didn't ah, no, no, on the iron, on the iron alpha, right, right, right. Like a white. yes, this, okay, yeah, 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 so he says, yeah, so because also he, indeed, he doesn't see, yeah, yeah, changes in the, yeah, I think I actually, I'm citing the paper when I introduced the, the parameter, the k-alpha-1 um, language parameter, and indeed he says, yeah, that he sees some sort of saturation, yeah, for the iron oxides at some point due to charge transfer effects, he doesn't see, yeah any more any evolution on the on the line with despite of the yeah increasing nominal spin uh, yes yeah. we 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 didn't try yeah i mean indeed one should go a little bit deeper and and try to understand why the gay alpha lines have this different sensitivity indeed because we we didn't try to to dig too much there but definitely there there are yeah there are many things actually also i think I think there is a Japanese group who also explained in terms of charge transfer for late 3D transition metal uh, atoms like nickel, for instance, um, I think charge transfer is actually very important to, to correctly simulate experimental uh, line shape. So charge transfer effects we really didn't explore, so they were not currently implemented in, in CRISPY, but uh, I think it's, it's worth to, to investigate more in that direction. Okay, 